Right, okay, okay, wonderful. All right, so then it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Uh, he's uh, Matush Tagarski. Uh, Matush uh, is an assistant professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, before that, uh, he obtained his PhD under the supervision of uh, Shantoy Dasgupta in 2013. And since then, he has worked uh, at a couple other institutions, including Rutgers University, University of Michigan, Microsoft Research, and so on. He is a, he's a well-known expert of deep learning theory. He has organized a, a, a semester-long program on deep learning at the Simons Institute uh, in 2019. And he has many other uh, fantastic achievements, uh, including an NSF Career Award uh, in 2018. So I guess I was told to like uh, tone it down and not go over the top with this introduction. So I guess I'm going to stop there and I'm going to pass it over to Matusha, uh, who is going to tell us about his first work in reinforcement learning theory. Okay, so thanks very much to the organizers for having me and thanks uh, Gergely for another um, very nice introduction. And yeah, I mean, this is a great, uh, this is a great seminar series. I'm really glad you guys have continued it now that, uh, you know, the universe is back into its normal rotation. And um, yeah, I really appreciate the invitation because as, as Gregory said, this is my first reinforcement learning paper. So if during the talk, anybody has a concern that I don't know something basic and there's a basic oversight, I would greatly appreciate, uh, you know, just don't feel bad, just, just say it publicly. So yeah, this, this, this talk, it's titled Actor Critic is Implicitly Biased Towards High Entropy Optimal Policies. The story is in my core areas, something I study is what's called the, uh, the implicit bias of, of optimization methods where they're implicitly regularized without any, you know, needing to do anything to the optimization algorithm or its objective function. And uh, we realized that um, the same thing is going, a version of the same thing is going on in reinforcement learning. So we would, we would like to propose this line of work and we hope many of you work on it. So this is joint work with Yu Jung Hu and, and Zui Ji. And I've given versions of this before and I'm, very indebted to people who have spoken up and spoken to me during and after and, and helped me a lot to get up to speed with, with reinforced learning. So amongst those people that have just spent a lot of time helping me a lot were Alek Agarwal, uh, Nan Jiang, uh, Sivitej and Magaluri, and, and of course, Gergely's spoken to me about this uh, multiple times and very supportive. So I, I'm very grateful. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, like I said, because I'm an outsider, I'm going to kind of present things in a way that to me is the most boiled down way. So if the slides look a little sparse, it's just kind of like a cross, cross area communication attempt. Okay, so this is what I want to accomplish today. Uh, this one slide will hopefully settle a lot of the concerns about the setting and, and what we're doing today. So like a lot of reinforcement learning papers, I'm trying to maximize what's called the value function. I'm the discount reward setting. I'll define it in two slides or so. So don't worry if you don't know what I'm talking about. So I'm trying to maximize the, the, the value function. I'm using this regret style averaged version. And I have some funny exponent that we will discuss later. But I'm trying to maximize value function with high probability. And here are some things that I think set this work apart. So the algorithm is something that was important to me. The algorithm, uh, I said simply in quotes, because of course that's the eye of the beholder. But just to be more specific, the, al the algorithm is stochastic natural policy gradient. and and TD, temporal difference learning. So natural policy gradient, it needs estimates of um, the Q function. Uh, if you know what it is, it'll get defined. And uh, we use TD for that. Uh, everything is stochastic. So it's a fully specified explicit algorithm. And the policies will be what I call linear softmax policies. Let's define the next slide too, or two slides. Okay, so this is my first work in RL. And to kind of try to make it what I thought was the most RL setting, turns out I was wrong, was, it learns from a single trajectory to the MDP. So you, you just have one trajectory, you follow one policy for a while, switch to another policy, switch to another policy. You just follow one sequence to the MDP and uh, just keep switching policies. And eventually um, the average value you, incur, you, you incurred during this will, will be approximately optimal. Now, I should say that of course, there are many reinforced learning settings, including things like offline RL that are much different from this. And so this is both good and bad. Uh, and we will, I'll discuss the fact that it's both good and bad. But just so you know that I was doing this because uh, I was trying to be as far away from my usual sort of IAD settings as possible in my mind. So I would say that maybe for experts, the key 
thing that sets this paper apart from others is that there's none of what I would call explicit exploration or an equivalent. And I'll say what I mean by equivalent. So when I looked at similar papers uh, that used similar algorithms, they had to throw in things like epsilon greedy, or they had to do something like projections. Let me explain why these are actually similar. So if we're using linear softmax policies, if this just goes too fast, they'll be defined soon. But linear softmax policy, you just have some, some vector and you apply softmax to it. If that vector is close to zero, then that policy is close to uniform over actions. So projection and regularization actually induce some sort of explicit exploration. So by so it's not enough to just not do ex, epsilon greedy. To really say we're not doing any explicit exploration, we have to rule out a whole category of things. And along with this, there are a lot of things that are kind of subtly equivalent to like epsilon greedy or, or projections. Uh, another one is many papers I've seen, they, they assume they have an assumption at the top of the paper which says every policy encountered by this algorithm has the following mixing rate. I, I, Th that is also some sort of explicit regularization because up, up front, you know, you can, if I just write down the set of linear policies, I can set it up so that, you know, the mixing time gets slower and slower and slower. So I can, I, the mixing time is unbounded. So um, there's this whole block of assumptions that I say are semi-equivalent to, to explicit exploration, and none of them are used in this, in this paper. And it was, this was my technical goal actually in this work was to was was to not have any of this okay so if this sounds vague i uh, it'll we'll get the full written out algorithm in four slides but yeah this is kind of for me this is my personal purpose of this paper okay oh and i should just make a philosophical comment that i've received from many experts which is that at no point am i trying to imply that implicit implicit exploration is better than explicit exploration i'm just trying to say that it's possible though of course the rates uh may be worse than what you've seen with explicit exploration. Just getting started. Okay. So in terms of technical contributions, so these are kind of the theorems, but maybe some of the lemmas are interesting too. So one thing is that it, within the paper, we use an exact correspondence between natural policy grade and mirror descent, not an approximate correspondence. They're the same. Uh, so that's useful in two ways. One is inside the proof, uh, the, the error of natural policy screening decouples into two terms, and that's thanks to this equivalence with mirror descent. A sep second one is that, of course, as the title says, this paper's implicitly biased. Mirror descent is an implicitly biased algorithm. So by writing natural policy screening as mirror descent, we just get the implicit bias for free. We just have to interpret it in, a, in, a, in what it means for the Markov chain. But uh, we don't have to do any new math to actually get an implicit bias to arise. And lastly, uh, kind of to my surprise, so as I mentioned, most of the papers that I've personally seen, they use some sort of assumption that implies that all the policies mix. I didn't want to do that. I just wanted to say the policies mix. I, uh, I was a little surprised at how little there was in the literature that I could use. So I had to prove mixing lemmas just from like, you know, the earth, I had to like pull up the atoms. <laughs> so uh, you'll see what I mean. Uh, I'll mention this later. But if, if, you're an, if you're an expert and you're wondering what, what could be useful in this paper to you, maybe some of these lemmas are, are useful. And let me say the downsides of this paper, especially and I'm grateful to the community for, for kind of cluing me in on these. So I wrote that the rate has an O of one in the numerator. This O, so I, all the RL theory experts I talked to, they're very concerned with, um, with analysis of algorithms that are adapted to the inherent complexities of the MDP. They don't just pay for things like number of actions, number of states, polynomial. And I actually explicitly hide such bad things in here. So this analysis in its current form is not able to, um, it, it doesn't directly give a good ad ad adaptation to the structure of the MDP. Like it doesn't have a Bellman rank or something. So uh, just getting started, um, you know, I think those things can be fixed, but in this current paper, these terms are hidden, and I, I apologize for that. Another one that I know frustrates a lot of people is I, I use a structural assumption, something called a linear MDP. I will explain this shortly. Uh, this is a bad assumption. Uh, it is used, it is, in the current analysis, it's necessary when using this TD method. Uh, we will discuss this more. Lastly, in order to be able to just use a single trajectory to the MDP, I mean, 
this has to be a weird MDP, right? Like you, you, there's no way to get stuck inside of it, for instance. So, um, you know, there needs to be some assumption on the MDP and the form of the one that I use is that uh, there exists an optimal policy which visits all states. So this is the assumption we need. You can interpret this in various ways. One way to interpret it is that you just take an MDP and you put backlinks, which should it kick you out into other states. Um, yeah, so, th so this, is, this is kind of what we need or the way we are able to learn from a single trajectory. So this is basically the talk in one slide. So are there any high level questions before we do the details? Um, I have a question actually. Uh, is this uh, requirement of single trajectory through MDP um, like technical assumption or is like a, just a high level assumption you're making? So for example, could you change your proof to work with the setting where you can restart from the starting state or something? Right. So first of all, um, there is a quick reduction, which is I take whatever MDP you have, which doesn't have that, and I can add backlinks. So you know, if you have like a video game where you can die and you can get stuck, then if you interpret like a reset button as an explicit part <laughs> of the MDP, then it'll be here. Um, so as you can tell, I'm not an RL theory expert. I made this assumption because I thought it was like the, I thought it was actually making the problem more difficult, but everyone's told me it's the opposite. So. Um, so to technically answer your question, I would say, I believe that many of these other ones, we can um, handle them by adding these backlinks. Uh, it'll probably change some constants and stuff. Uh, in terms of the math proofs, no, it definitely isn't needed. So if we if we just do restarts, the proofs actually simplify. I mean, I uh, let, let, me, let me say it another way. I mentioned that we learned from a single trajectory, we're doing multiple policies. I have to deal with nasty stuff like your um, your your estimates are paying for all sorts of garbage, right? In your markup right. chain, this year. so it actually makes the analysis more painful. In fact, there's a really painful part of the proof where I have to deal with non-independence dealing from different policies. So it's really actually just causes pain. It causes pain to do this. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. But it's a it's a good comment that I sort of missed the missed the yeah maybe I, the paper should have been done differently to not require this. Chaba, you had a question. No, it's it's more like I want to reinforce of what you're saying. So I'm surprised someone's saying that this is an easy setting. This is the hardest setting ever. Uh, so I I I really admire uh, your uh, I don't know like uh, very eager approach of jumping in the middle of this and uh, trying the hardest settings. So the only thing that one could uh, quibble about is is this uh, assumption that the optimal policy is going to go everywhere. Uh, of course, the optimal policy doesn't want to go go everywhere. It wants to go to some good states and just stay there most yeah. of the time. And there is no easy fix for that. So I think that maybe that is that is the the pain point of uh, of the argument that you're gonna make, but. Yeah, there there could be some environments when when this is the case, and I think it's it's pretty interesting still. Yeah. Yeah. So thanks thanks for that comment, and to tie that into Gar, uh, Garov's comment. So, um, so what I was saying before wasn't actually quite true. So if we just add backlinks to some MDP, then we would still have to somehow cheat by satisfying this condition. So yeah, this condition is 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 pretty bad. Okay, so yeah, maybe people that want to follow up directly on this work, maybe this is one of the things to, to attack next. Okay, so uh, here's the outline of the talk. I'm going to fully specify the algorithm and I'll introduce all the assumptions along the way. And then I will give the, um, and then I'll give just the theorem and proof. And um, I'll watch the clock, uh, but I actually don't have that many slides. So this level of discussion is uh, basically fine. Okay, so the algorithm has an outer loop and an inner loop. The outer loop is uh, this natural policy gradient. Natural policy gradient is going to need to estimate the Q function its updates, and that's going to be an inner loop, which runs TD to do to do the, the, the Q estimation. Okay, so first I'll explain the notation needed to define this outer loop. And to be clear, I'm going to define the outer loop, I'm going to define the inner loop, and I'll show them together at the end. Um, so this is, again, what I call a linear softmax policy. Uh, what I mean by that, if you haven't seen it or if I'm using the terminology incorrectly, is at the core, I'm maintaining a matrix which has um, 
D, it's D by K. So my states are encoded as elements of R to the D. My actions are going to just be K actions encoded as standard basis vectors. And what my policy does is it hits this matrix on the left by a state, on the right by an action. And in order to determine the probability of taking an action in a given state, it's going to take the softmax over um, by varying the actions and letting the state be fixed. So states are going to be elements of, of R to the D. Uh, so they're, they're not necessarily basis vectors, but the actions are going to be encoded to standard basis vectors. OK, um, and this, this was just honestly the easiest setup for, for this sort of analysis in this algorithm. Okay, so the Q function and the value function, I hope these definitions are, are, the, are, the, are the standard ones. So for those of you haven't seen, I'm using something called discounted reward for better and for worse. Uh, so this thing is just saying we take the expectation of our trajectories following this policy pi, and we don't just look at kind of our cumulative reward, we, we discount it over time with um, taking this discount factors between zero and one and, and exponentiating it. And so, yeah, what this notation means is the expectation over, over these trajectories, interaction with the MVP, and um, I just fix the first state in action. And the value function, I guess this notation, um, so Gaurav, who spoke earlier, Gaurav Mahajan and um, Shankar Kare, Jason Lee, and Alec Agarwal, they have, uh, they, they have a kind of, I think, maybe the current, uh, they have a very nice policy grade analysis that many people like. And one of the things they define in there is this value function, which takes in a distribution where you, uh, this, so this is what we're off maximizing in our algorithm, take expectation over states, and then given a state, we follow our policy. And so what the value is defined as, it's the expectation over, over um, trajectories starting from states sampled from this distribution. And you can also just write it as um, this expectation over Q functions. Okay, so this is what we're maximizing. This should be standard if you accept the Kool-Aid of discounted reward, which I should add is actually a form of regularization. So I'm a little unhappy about that. But anyway, um, and actually, Gergely is one person who pointed out to me that it's kind of like regularization. OK, but anyway, back to the point. So the, out, the uh, outer loop of the algorithm is going to look like this. If this looks weird to you, I will explain it on the next slide. We have one more outer loop slide. So I'll, OK, so what the algorithm does is it starts just at 0. And let me just say 0 is very nice in uh, reinforcement learning or in this algorithm because what zero means is that in every state I'm just uniform over actions. So if you just interpret zero, if you interpret zero in this uh, softmax, it's uniform over actions. So zero is a nice place to start. And this also gives some intu intuition on how the, uh, how the implicit bias is gonna work. We're gonna stay near zero for a long time and that's gonna be like implicitly forcing exploration. Um, let me just finish this part, Chab, and then I'll and I'll take your question. So the way the update's going to work is our weight, our parameter matrix at time t plus one is going to be the one at time t plus a step size time and times an estimate of the q function. And I'm going to write this estimate of the q function with the. It's always going to have a pre up here. I mean, like a. I'm going to call it a pre q function. What this is, it's a matrix. It's a matrix, so it has the same shape as the parameter matrix, and it approximates the true Q function. Okay, so it's a matrix that if you hit on the left with the state and on the right with the action, it approximates the Q function, and this is going to be learned by the inner loop. Um, so let me just go to the next slide, then I'll take Chaba's question, which I suspect might be related to why I'm calling this natural policy gradient. Let me just take uh, Chaba's question, and then I'll uh, go through this slide. So go ahead, Chaba. Yeah, uh, I was just wondering about uh, that you said that zero is really nice. Uh, I guess uh, you're saying that you like the uniform policy, uh, but the uniform policy is not really a panacea, right? Like it's, 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 really it's kind of like if, if I if I start to duplicate actions, for example, like I have the same action, it has the same effect, but I call it under different names, then the uniform policy suddenly looks uh, kind of biased and like not not tr too interesting and so it's mm -hmm. like it, it seems to me that there is something hidden in this uh um assumption that the uniform policy is nice so what what do you what do you say about this Have oh um right let me think so uh 
where I think this will come up. So, I mean, there's definitely not an assumption, but I mean, you're right that I'm kind of uh, overselling using zero. I'll just say that when I give the actual bound, uh, it'll have a KL divergence. And this KL divergence will pay for things like what you're saying, uh, these duplicated actions. And algorithmically to deal with things like these duplicate actions, I mean, I don't, I don't see a, yeah, not a simple modification. So, um, but yeah, I'll just take your point as uh, I am overselling the, the zero being good to some extent. Yeah, one, one would think that it would be more natural to measure everything in terms of distributions over next states and not distributions over the actions, which is what seems to be happening here. Oh, I see. Uh, but maybe it's not super clear how to do that in a <laughs> um, computationally well, efficient way. Well, um, okay, we're looking ahead a little bit, but let me just make this comment. So I'll explain on this slide how this is equivalent to mirror descent. Sure. One of the benefits of using mirror descent is that mirror descent, of course, if you aren't familiar, is a family of algorithms that's parameterized. And when when I instantiate so if you go backwards, if you start from mirror descent and then use it to derive natural policy gradient, you have a bunch of flexibility in how you choose the prox function. And that prox function encodes all sorts of stuff. And when I tried to make the proof work, uh, I actually found three different ways to derive natural policy gradient using mirror descent. All of them in the proof were different, but the algorithm was the same. All I'm saying is that there probably is a way, and I mean, of course, like, uh, you know, like, Gergely uses natural policy grid. I mean, he uses mirror descent for his analyses too. Anyway, I'm just, there's a there's like a degree of freedom that I'm not exploiting in natural in, in mirror descent here that might be able to to do what you're saying, just run on a fundamentally different space. But here, yeah, here I I don't I didn't uh, I wasn't able to do that. <laughs> okay, so let me just define. Are, are you satisfied with that answer, or is it okay? Okay, cool. So let me say a little bit more about the algorithm and for. You know, like Garov is here, he's on this prior work I mentioned in sight right here. So let me explain why I'm calling this uh, natural policy gradient. So again, the algorithm is we have an estimate of the Q function and we add that into a parameter vector and we just keep going. So this is not, if you look in like Sham's original papers, this is not the Sham Kakade's original stuff on this thesis, whatever, it, or yeah, it's old stuff. It's not the original definition. So let me explain. If you look in this paper by, by Garov and, um, and Jason Lee Shamkakade and, and Alec Ogarwal, they point out that if you take the classical natural policy gradient and you specialize it to, uh, to the tabular case, it's equivalent to this update. And this update is actually equivalent to my update. Let me just say, or it's almost equivalent. Let me say why. So there's something in, I'm not gonna mention again, so I'm saying it briefly, called the advantage function. The advantage function, it only changes per state by a constant, by a state-specific constant. So in terms of the, uh, the behavior of the policy, these two are actually equivalent, which is a softmax eats it, that constant per state. And um, on top of that, they use the exact Q function for their main analysis or the exact advantage function. Here, of course, I'm using a stochastic estimate. And this is actually the starting point. So instead, so they, prove that this is equivalent to the classical natural policy gradient, I say, no, 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 let's actually just call this policy gradient. <laughs> let's call this policy gradient. This is what's equivalent to mirror descent. And um, under the assumptions I have not yet stated, so this linear MDP assumption, or there's another one called compatible function approximation, which uh, also our results hold under, uh, you can prove that this is equivalent to um, natural policy gradient in the classic definition. So I'm only going to use this definition, which like I said, is verbatim a mirror descent. And then to translate it into the original version, you can actually just use the, the proof that they, that they wrote here for the tabular case that you can adapt it to to other cases. So if this if this looked weird to you, if it looked like I'm lying what, mirror de, what natural policy gradient is, I'm using the equivalence in this point to, to get away with calling this natural policy gradient. And then you might ask, okay, so what? Uh, well, so the benefit of writing it as mirror descent, so we actually do not use uh, Garov and friends analysis. Uh, we, so once we write this as mirror descent, we don't have to do a proof. <laughs> we just take an off the shelf mirror descent analysis. And what's the benefit? Mirror descent, as I mentioned, has an implicit bias. It's just baked in. 
Uh, that's not exploited in this prior work, um, but there is this term, an implicit bias term, and that's going to be our implicit exploration. And if that's not clear, it'll be clear when I just write stuff out. So if you, if, if, if anybody was concerned that I'm lying about uh, natural policy gradient and, and what it is, that was a good concern. I hope I've, I've settled it with this slide. This is a cool paper, by the way. I should say that um, our starting point was that Zhu Ag, one of one of the co-authors, he he produced a much shorter uh, version of the specialized tabular case proof. I looked at it, and I realized um, with a little bit more work, it's it's equivalent to mirror descent. So that's how how we started, thanks to this work here. Okay. Okay. And th this is just one of many works in this paper. They do many other things. All right, so I haven't told you how to estimate the Q function. We actually need to do a little bit of work there. Um, I'm not going to say this in detail. I'm just flashing it because it's standard. Uh, this is what, so I need to estimate the Q function. This is what people call temporal difference learning. Uh, this is the standard way to uh, estimate a Q function. Uh, like you, you just, up, you try to, it effectively minimizes this thing called squared Bellman error. And um, yeah, you just run this, and then we take the average of that over time. Now, in this case, too, we were not able to use an off-the-shelf TD analysis. Uh, and I'll say why in a moment. But this is the standard-ish TD algorithm. One difference is that if you look up TD in, in all the presentations I know, they, they typically need to do some kind of projection. Um, or they need to make assumptions that are kind of like projections. Uh, but um, yeah, by the way, I just saw a question in the chat. Actions are a list of unit vectors, so can't you just duplicate them? Chaba's comment wasn't that duplicate vectors uh, break the algorithm. Chaba was, was suggesting that if we have an algorithm which is actually sensitive to duplicate actions, then it can it can learn more efficiently than, than this algorithm here. So this algorithm is slower than one that's kind of smart about those uh, those duplicate actions. That was that was Chubb, Chubb's comment. Okay, so yeah, I have the chat open by the way. Okay, so back to this. So this this should be standard standard uh, TD. Just we have to do a few non-standard things in the proof. And now let me explain this linear MDP assumption. So the TD method, just if you write it out in the classical Cyclist Roy analysis, it converges to. I mean, this is just some. You could view this as some fixed point algorithm. It has a fixed point. It converges to it. But we need to argue that this fixed point is actually the true Q function. If you just run this like matrix approximation to the Q function on an arbitrary MDP, you're just going to get junk back. So we need an assumption, or we use an assumption. Oh, sorry, there's a spurious comma here. Okay, so the assumption, so this, so we need some assumption to make this go through. We need, we need our matrix approximation of the Q function to behave like a Q function. Like the true, like the true expected, you know, infinite sum Q function. So here's the assumption. The assumption is that there exists a fixed matrix M and a fixed vector Y, so that in words, the MDP dynamics are modeled by this matrix M and this and this vector Y. So uh, stated in symbols, the state transition probabilities are modeled by this matrix M. So I have this notation I'm inventing where I take SA pairs and I just vectorize them. I just didn't want to write tensors out. So um, yeah, there's a matrix which gives you the expected state you're going to transition to. And there's also a vector which gives you the expected rewards. So I should say this is a strong assumption. I mean, I of course have a plan to drop it, but um, this work, especially previous times I presented it, this assumption was something that made a lot of people very, uh, very unhappy. Uh, if you're very cynical, you could say that this is not much different than just assuming the tabular setting. And um, that's not an unfair criticism because the proof, uh, yeah, I mean, we, yeah, I mean, it just feels somewhat, somewhat, somewhat like, you know, epsilon beyond tabular to some sense. So this is a strong assumption. Okay, so just to finish this out though, so why do we not use a standard analysis of TD? Well, whenever I looked at TD proofs in the literature and I looked over many of them, I found things like um, I needed to use, they needed projections to make things not blow up. And I didn't want to use anything that looked like projections or regularization. 
Also, they often assumed some sort of uniform condition numbers. They needed a condition number. They needed something that looked like a condition number on this problem uh, to be bounded. And the problem is that we're just following trajectories through through space, through you know, the MDP. So we have to rerun TD over and over and over again. And uh, I got worried, and at least when I've done back the envelope calculations, that those condition numbers actually can diverge to infinity through the course of the algorithm. So yeah, I was not able to use prior work on um, on TD. I also saw lots of like mixing assumptions. So uh, I'm not claiming I read all of the papers. Uh, obviously, I'm not an expert, but there there are reasons why we could not use uh, and why I also think that there are some interesting things in our TD analysis. So I'll come back to the TD proof in a moment. But so this uh, so now here's the full algorithm, and I can give you the theorem. Um, yes, yeah, so the full algorithm is. We start at zero, as we've discussed a bit. So our initial matrix and initial policy are this like uniform policy. And OK, then we, so we're going one trajectory through the MDP. So what do we do? The first thing we do is we collect a bunch of samples with the current policy. Just get this big collection of M samples from that one policy. I use TD on that big sequence to um, just get one Q function estimate. Uh, some, people have, some people have called these outer inner loop uh, type algorithms, they've called them um, two time scale. So that if you Google two time scale in RL, I think you get a bunch of papers that do, do something like this. And then we then we update using that Q function. Okay. So that's the whole algorithm. And the contrast with uh, prior work is that whenever I looked at prior work that has something like this, they need lots of projections. They sometimes need to like do something weird to kind of purify the samples when they enter a new state, like before they, they need to like warm up the, the Markov chain for TD or something. Uh, stuff like this. Uh, so I mentioned some of those works here. Oh, yeah. And so I, I hadn't messed, but we've discussed it before. There's this assumption that uh, and it, there exists an optimal policy visiting all states. And like I said, because we're not restarting the Markov chain, there's no reset button. So when I accumulate these samples, they just start from the end state of the last trajectory. OK, so let me get this question. And anyone else who has a question, this is a good time for questions, because then I'm just going to give the theorem. Sorry to say. So are you saying that there is a choice of the vectors in the type of oh yeah, so this th there's this question um can we write uh, can we write the tabular setting in this linear setting? Yes, uh, there are a lot of by the way, this is a common thing in the literature. so um, the place I found that actually was when I mentioned if you Google this compatible function approximation assumption, there are many papers that use it. I'm just remembering off the top of my head there's a paper by Chijin at Princeton and colleagues. Where they, uh, you know, they have some very sophisticated RL algorithm, and they use compatible linear function approximation. And like right after they define it, they just have a quick proposition that says, um, uh, you know, you can encode the the. So yeah, you can check it yourself, but it's also just a very standard thing when the linear MDP type assumptions are brought up. And there's another question: um, optimal value equals value, optimal policy equals value optimal. Ah, yes. So I mean, um, yes, a pop. It's, it's a policy which, when I say optimal policy, I mean a policy which obtains the optimal, optimal value from that starting state according to the discounted reward value function. Okay, any other questions? I saw Chava, you have one? Yeah, I, actually this uh, <laughs> made me wonder about yet another thing. So you have this initial state distribution mu, Yes. And if you are not resetting to it, and then you just start to follow policies, then somehow that distribution is going to get destroyed. So I wonder how can you be optimal with respect to that? That distribution is going to be forgotten if you have yeah. a trajectory only. Yeah. And so um, hard to to make work. Um, I guess maybe the assumptions are going to imply something. Sorry. Uh, just thinking aloud that uh, if you make strong enough realizable assumptions, then you can actually represent the optimal policy and you will get that, and then that can save it. Yeah, I'm not sure it comes out of the, so the only, I have two explanations for this. So one is that mm -hmm. maybe the right way to look at what our algorithm is doing is that um, our Q function converges to an optimal Q function. There's some similar similarities to, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. There are some similarities between natural policy gradient and some of these like either Q iteration or value iteration. I always I always get them mixed up. But um, I mean the way our theorem is actually stated, 
is it's going to say for all states s are um we're competitive for all states s right, right right i should actually say that um so the the, the prior work i mentioned by garov and colleagues they have a natural policy gradient analysis in the tabular case uh with exact q functions and their theorem is stated as uh you know given a fixed starting distribution mu we compete with that mu actually if you rewrite their proof you can just remove that if you rewrite their proof um just you can make it just work uniformly over states and i think this is consistent with a lot of other rl algorithms which can now in terms of how there will be some subtleties if you have a single trajectory only but uh otherwise i agree well yeah i would say that maybe the way we're cheating then is by the ability to always you know the optimal policy of business all states we can always kind of come back i guess it sort of washes it's not washes. only that i think that the i don't know whether it's okay to call it a cheat or not but the assumptions that you're making allow you to represent explicitly the optimal policy and the optimal value function and this is uh the algorithm's error signal is driving it towards this and so it the initial state distribution is not going to matter as as also your theorem shows that that's how that's how things are if you would try to relax these reliability assumptions then maybe you would find it very difficult to uh to even state any optimality result for any not any state but any initial uh, distribution because uh the setting is just so that like it may be not possible to get that yeah no i agree so i don't have a good answer and i agree with uh, i agree with your comment yeah it's definitely helping us like these yeah these single trajectory assumptions um i see garov has a question uh yeah are you going to uh pay uh for this initial distribution uh in your regret or the oh i understand are you, like are you talking something about like this um these sort of like infinity norm scaling terms that you right so, so for example yes yeah, for in your rate I, I mean there is this uh like any of these constants going to depend on like how far away from optimal distribution your initial distribution where so unfortunately this is one of the things i was referring to when i said the paper has a bit of evil in it that is all hidden inside the O. Worse than that, it is not written explicitly in the lemmas. So you have to look at the proofs. And where it comes up in the proofs is when we control the mixing times. Right. I see. I think and that's where mixing... maybe it kind of shows up, right? Because like wherever you start from is going to cons like change the constants. If you start yes. from exactly optimal, you you'll be fine. And I should say that in terms of of um, you know things people could do to improve this paper, like follow-up work. I don't actually think, I don't actually think, I, I mean, I don't think, I don't think it was done quite correctly in this paper. Like I think um, the way TD and, and MD, I mean, I'll discuss this later, like maybe in, maybe in like the subsequent portion of the talk, but uh, I don't know an easy way to get like the right dependencies that you're looking for basically. Yeah, and Gergely, Gergely pointed out in the chat that there's a one over the probability of optimal, and that, that term explicitly appears, that explicitly appears in our in our proof. And uh, I'm slowly working through removing all such instances, but I don't actually know how to do it right now. But okay, maybe um, let me just state the theorem then, so it seems like a good time to state the theorem. Um, so the assumption should be like what I said before, I'm just being fancy, this ergodic maxent policy, that's just a fancy way of saying that policy assumption we've made all along. M was the variable I was using for the number of inner steps. So you give me a T, I should say that given T. So you give me a T, which is the number of outer loop iterations. The inner loop iterations is just T squared. I have a step size for mirror descent or natural policy gradient, and I have a step size for, um, for, for the TD, and they're this, like where they're disgusting. And um, so here's the theorem. The only surprise, the only thing that you you haven't seen yet. Oh yeah, so the total number of samples is then t cubed. So that's t to the 316. So you can interpret it as number of samples to the one over 16. So the thing you haven't seen before is that the left hand side is, um, is has a KL. So before I was just telling you that this is what the paper gives you. It actually also gives you this on the left hand side. 
so you can interpret it as the you know the like the you know the max of the two you can interpret it as um the paper simultaneously gives you a kl bound and a value function bound that i started the talk with and what i'll say more is that the way the proof works is the proof maintains this KL condition for all policies I. So throughout the proof, we maintain that we stay in this good KL ball around this optimal policy. And um, yeah, this is how this is the implicit bias. So we implicitly stay in this ball without explicitly using a KL regularizer. And from here, we derive all the things people usually get with explicit. Uh, and before I answer Thomas' question, let me just say, the most similar prior work I'm aware of is a paper in the tabular case. They have an almost a very so in the tabular case, they are able to use a similar two time scale, uh, you know, natural or I guess they call it natural actor critic type algorithm. And um, they are able to remove this, you know, this their number of samples is actually just one over six, not one to the 16. I mean, there's some other apples and oranges things like their guarantees and expectation. This one's in probability one over two to the one eight. I'll say that they use up some greedy, and they also they they use one of these uniform uh, mixing time assumptions. But they're also in the single trajectory. This paper is in the single trajectory setting. So this is um, I don't I don't remember um, all the authors. I apologize, but this is Kodada Dian, and this is a uh, Muruguli who I mentioned at the very talk. Sivitaja Muruguli who I mentioned at the top of the at the beginning of the talk. So Chaba, what's what's up? Yeah. So just a clarification question about this uh, pi bar policy. Uh, so what do you exactly mean by this? Like, what is this policy? This is the uniform policy? What it is? Okay, so this is a little annoying. I shouldn't have, honestly, I shouldn't have just put in. So if there exists a policy that visits every state, we can define another policy, which um, in every state takes the uniform distribution over all op optimal actions. So we can define an optimal set of actions every state, and then we can define this like uniform over optimal policies action. Uh, okay. Sorry, uniform over optimal actions policy. We can prove it's still optimal. Sure. And I call that the maximum entropy policy. Okay. It's, it was stupid of me because I don't actually use the structure of that policy anywhere in the paper. So the paper could have just used any policy that visits every state as a comparator. I originally planned to prove something stronger using this maxent policy but then uh all the proofs i wrote were wrong <laughs> so they got pulled <laughs> but um you can just think of this as being any policy that if you use any policy that visits all right. the states in the mdp the proof goes through i mean that kl bond is not really a bond it just says that it never gets too far from this thing yeah right so originally i actually wanted to prove that this is that there's a way to make this go down to zero right. that you converge but that's actually that's actually false it's it demonstrably false it's i mean the algorithm doesn't do it and yeah really examples uh yeah so i originally tried to prove it then then zu ag one of the co-authors he like instantly produced a counter example and i was really flustered and then i implemented the algorithm and yeah it doesn't it doesn't converge to help to the max sense solution so oh. yeah. I said that under the right set of assumptions, it actually converges to the optimal policy, so it doesn't, or it, it doesn't converge to the optimal max end policy. That's uh, right. So yeah, if, it, it, I mean if if the optimal it can policy get stuck in somewhere, some okay. Yeah, yeah. okay. I get it. Okay. See. I mean the counterexamples are cool. So I mean I can discuss them in a half hour. Mm -hmm. this, mm -hmm. but, yeah. Um okay, so Let's let's do it this way because um, you know, like it's very important that we end on time. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to say the proof outline. I'm going to say what I think are the most interesting aspects of the proof. I have four slides on the proof that we will not do. Um, and what I'll just do is I'll answer questions in the subsequent portion. Or if anybody, I think the slides are posted and I, I did actually try to write these kind of carefully. Like I think they're, you know, kind of cleaner than the presentation of the paper. So Okay, so the way the proof works is, as I mentioned, uh, prior work, they needed explicit exploration and explicit regularization to control many quantities. The way we're going to get away with it is we're going to have this KL term, and that's going to be enough. So throughout the proof, we're going to maintain the fact that this KL is small. So if I just make this pi, if I make this pi i, I'm going to make, I'm going to ensure that 
max over i, this kl, is that small quantity from before, just log k over one minus gamma squared. Uh, and we maintain that inductively. And it's a, I think the induction is kind of cute. The induction is a simultaneous induction on TD and on the behavior of MD. So at every round, and every round we, we need a guarantee on MD and TD, which requires the good behavior of MD and TD in the previous rounds. So in round I, we're going to have that um, all previous estimated Q functions output by TD were correct. And using off-the-shelf mirror descent, we're going to get that both the KL, the new KL, and the average value function are large. Uh, you can just view this as just, yeah, just a truly standard like regret type guarantee. Um, and then simultaneously, if our KL is small, that means our policy is not too crazy and it's going to ensure everything we need for the Q function to be correct. I mean, I should also say that this is using the linear, this is where the linear MDP assumption is used. Um, but uh, in particular, the KL, the KL bound is going to be enough to ensure the Markov chain mixes fast. Okay, so that's the structure of the proof. I'll say a couple comments and then, um, so yeah, here are the most interesting things. So I'm just gonna call this the visitation distribution. If you're not familiar with it, um, we'll just have to, you'll have to check afterwards. But the point is this visitation distribution is common in analysis of a lot of these types of algorithms. Uh, and we it's baked into the definition of the KL. So this is where I said we have a degree of freedom when constructing the mirror descent. The mirror descent, we actually bake in the value of uh, the, this visitation distribution. This is kind of funky because you would say, wait, does that mean the algorithm has access to this crazy object? object? No, uh, it only affects the proof. The algorithm doesn't care. It washes out in the algorithm. So this is a degree of freedom, which I found very cool. There's also ways to define this algorithm without the visitation distribution. I just found this cleanest for, for the proofs. Um, so again, so I defined this set, which is this set of, um, and this is also why I was hesitating on, on Chaba's question about the starting state. This is the set of um, KL di distributions of visitation. It's the visitation measure for the optimal policy starting from different states S and I intersect over all such balls. So I'm that's how I control all starting states simultaneously, technically. Uh, and so the proof formally maintains that we stay in this set S for all iterations. Otherwise the same as before. Okay, this is just, this isn't really math yet. This is just um, like a trick. Uh, so let me just say that what I think is interesting in this paper and then we'll stop. So as I mentioned, we need a proof that says that if you're an S, so if your KL divergence is small, then your policy is not too crazy. So in particular, in order for my, you know, my bounds to just be actual numbers and not like, you know, just infinity, I need to bound the mixing time. So I need to bound how long, how many steps I need to, to do T, the, the inner, that stochastic TD. How many steps do I need to do that? Uh, so I need to uniformly control the mixing time of that inner Markov chain. So these M1 and M2, these are M1 and M2 over the entire course of the algorithm. And I'll just say that I, when, in many RL papers I see, they just assume that these things are bounded. Uh, they just, you know, they just assume that the mixed times encountered by the algorithm are bounded. So it's proved here, and I have to say it wasn't fun. Uh, it was surprisingly unfun. Um, so for people that run into this, that they want to bound mixing times, uh, maybe the lemmas I used are, are, are helpful. Let me just give an example. I thought this would be like in a mixing time book. I'd look in their book. I'd look up a theorem. It'd say like assume reversibility, assume this, assume that. So it was surprisingly, um, yeah. So th th this is, if you want to follow up on this line of work, I mean, in, in our paper, there's something funny here. There's like either either we did it wrong, like it shouldn't have been necessary to just redo so much stuff from scratch, or yeah, just like a de better KL divergence, something. I don't know. But anyway, so there's a lemma that says if you're in that KL ball, then all the mixing times are good. And I should say that this, there was Garov's question about where we, are getting these bad constants they're really bad and there's there's this, there's like a couple steps they show really ugly when when doing these these controls 
there's another place where you get this min probability that Gergely mentioned. So they're, they're pretty bad. Okay. Um, the TD guarantee, it looks almost like a standard TD guarantee. The only thing I'll say is that it, it doesn't require projections and it doesn't require a condition number. So I'm just going to say vaguely, TD, you can view it as a fixed point algorithm on some affine operator. And people typically have to assume some condition number on that affine operator. Uh, I did a back of the envelope calculation. I could have been wrong, but I felt like it's possible that those condition numbers actually diverge to infinity. So I could not use the standard types of analyses. Um, but what I did was I think dumber. Uh, I, I just, uh, there's a way to analyze um, PD just like bare descent. It, there's like a nearly the same uh, proof goes through. And it also has this implicit bias term, just like the KLI on the left-hand side for MD. I have this square thingy here. Uh, I haven't seen this exploited in prior works. So this might be interesting to people. Um, I'm almost done, Chaba, so I'll just take the question if you don't mind after. Let me just say that the way this proof is done in this paper is not optimal. This is not an optimal proof, far from it. I'll just say, uh, I'll, just, I'll just be honest, I'll say it's a sloppy proof. Uh, I, was, I have been slowly redoing this work, as I mentioned, and I have a follow-up work in Colt where I have what I think is closer to like the right version of this proof and it fixes something that really bugged me about this proof. So this proof, it's an expectation. And um, I was able to get a high probability version of this proof. And that's uh, that's just, this is just a TD analysis, but a much more powerful TD analysis but following the same ideas without projection, et cetera, is in, is in this cult in like in two weeks or whatever, three weeks, four weeks. Uh, and then I'll take, I'll take Chava's question after this. Let me just mention one key thing that I thought was pretty cool that might be interesting to other people. And then I'll and then I'll take Chaba's. Then we're done, and I'll take Chaba's question. So I mentioned that if we use um, mirrored, yeah, and I'll I'll take your question moment. Sorry, Chaba. Um, I mentioned that when we use mirrored descent, that the error decouples nicely, and it was vague. So let me say what that means now. So if you take mirrored descent, and you just apply it with the right KL divergence, this one with the visitation distribution baked in, um, you just get this bound. It looks like a mass of terms, and I apologize, but just it is a standard mirror descent bound. I've got one prox thing here. I've got another prox or another divergence here. I have some nuisance squared gradient term. And then I have kind of my regret term. This regret term is written in terms of these estimated Q functions fed to us by TD. And this is where, uh, yeah, something kind of cute happens. So I want a left-hand side in terms of the value function. That's why we baked in the visitation distribution into the KL, we just use the performance difference lemma. If we use the performance difference lemma, it re rewrites this in terms of the value function. And we also need to add subtract the, the true expected Q function from this estimated one. And this term we can, this term is our TD error. So this is what I meant by an error decoupling. If you just apply mirror descent bounds, you end up with this uh, Q function term you then apply the performance difference lemma, and you just have to now control like a mirror descent error and a TD error. So that's what I meant by, by decoupling. And this was um, pretty adorable. This was actually kind of why I did, I, yeah, that's like, yeah, I thought this was cute. So maybe this is a useful and interesting error decomposition. Uh, I should also say that you can, um, like since Garb, Garb was on the call, or at least was, um, you can, um, you can abstract everything I've said in this slide actually from their paper. So their paper, uh, it's it uses the sentence of mirror descent like analysis. Um, you, you so you can actually just do a little bit of algebra and get a full mirror descent analysis. And they have a they have a performance difference lemma step. We have a performance from some step. So this is actually very close spiritually, I would say, to their proof, even though it has a couple uh, extra extra knobs that were pretty cool. Um, Okay, so that's it. Uh, this is what I said before. Uh, I guess I'll just, yeah, I don't really feel like summarizing. I'll just leave this slide up because uh, we're over time. So, oh, and yeah, I'll, and I'll take all the questions in the chat. I guess, I don't know how you guys want to do it now. I don't know if you want to um, turn off the, I don't know how you want to do it. It's up to you guys. 
Well, so first of all, well, just thank you for the talk. And I guess we now, okay, yeah, I can do like a little. Uh, Thanks for the applause. Thank but then now the, now the plan is that, well, we're going to delve into the questions. I can see that there are quite a few. Uh, and then like do a couple of them on the record. And then as it gets like more technical, which it will inevitably, uh, then we just go off the record. OK, great. And yeah, I apologize that I uh, like went turbo fast and ignored questions the last 10 minutes. I'm just bad at time management. No, no, no. It's um, but let, how about, so how about I go through all these questions in chat, or, or I guess, Chaba, you've been asking for like 10 minutes. So do you want to go first? Is it yeah. one of the ones in the chat? Or? Yeah, yeah, I, I can go first, and then we can take the questions of other people as well. Uh, so that was the proof for the TD um, yes. ergotum. And I would just like quick clarification question. There is a norm there. What norm is that? Is that the two norm? It just yes. like let me, the two norm? Yeah, let me explain uh, this in detail. Uh, to answer the question, yes, this one here is just a is just a two norm. Um, I should say that because these are like matrix Q functions, and because the linear MDP assumption, I find it useful to interpret this two norm like variationally. You know, as the supremum over all these like state action vectors. So this term, I'm just saying this because uh, many TD proofs, they actually give a bound on the supremum over SA pairs of the gap in the Q functions. And um, we actually don't control that here because uh, you know this term is not going to zero. And uh, it's, not, it's, it's not implied that it goes to zero from this bound. What we're really controlling is this thing here. And this is like an expected, this is like an expected TD error. So let me just explain what's, what all this means because it's not defined. Expectation over pi, what I mean is that's an expectation over the samples from the policy pi that I used to construct this thing. So that's like the that's like the typical expectation you get in a regret bound, like the leftmost term. This expectation is part of the loss function. So if I if I look at these x's, so these state action pairs sampled from the stationary distribution of the policies, the states are stationary, and then the actions are follow the action given by by pi in that in that stationary state. So the now it's like the so this is like a weighted, this is like a weighted two norm. It's like the squared error according to that stationary. Right, uh, right. Yeah. Okay. So that that makes more sense in a way, because this weighted two norm that you're talking about uh, makes some contractions happen, and and then the analysis is much nicer and. It's an easy analysis that, like I said, uh, I didn't do it correctly. It's not done correctly in this paper, but in this follow-up, it's like um, much cleaner. It looks like a regret analysis. It doesn't look like a new proof. It looks like a copy-paste of regret. I should say that um, I have mixed feelings about this. So like I said, I can't assume condition numbers, so I can't actually control the supremum. Uh -huh. But the fact, OK, I mentioned that the error decouples uh, and I have to control the TD error. I use this term to control the TD error, but massaging this, but I, I actually really wanted the infinity norm control. And uh -huh. this discrepancy is one of the places in the current proof where I introduce this um, one over like P probability that Gergely was mentioning. It, yeah, it comes yeah. in due to this term. So even though I was like kind of hyping up this proof, uh, it 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 is a current source of a one over probability, and I don't feel good about it, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Right. It, yeah. was that the your... own policy of policy kind of mismatched that somehow to control the policies regret, you want to have good control at state action pairs, which are not chosen very often by the policy, and that is not naturally given um, if if you are using TD and and they are not you're not making strong assumptions, I guess. Well, I, I mean, I'm already even making strong assumptions. Right? I make linear MDP, and and I should say, right. Garof, I, yeah, uh, Garof was asking about that mismatched constant term earlier, and and I, I actually said it was somewhere else, so it does appear somewhere else even worse. But but yeah, it appears here, like you say too, when I do this conversion. So yeah. 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 So I wonder, 
like this dependence on number of states or this inverse probability whatnot there are ways of avoiding this because you only want to argue that in the feature space things are happening the way they should be happening which you can which you can argue with because you have linear mdps uh, so i think that there should be a way of extending your results that avoids this minimum probability in fact gergo mentioned that we do have this similar analysis or kind of like very close analysis in polit like we call it polytech but it's like basically the same thing uh, mirror descent and you're estimating action wave functions and um, and there in the analysis the point is that we do not have this dependence on, on this minimum probabilities um, but there could be that well we are simplifying things because we are not in the continuing case uh, but at the same time, you are making this strong assumption that the optimal policies are going to go everywhere. So it's like maybe under these settings, it's it's uh, it is possible to overall avoid these very inconvenient terms. I agree. I mean, I have a response, but it looks like Gergely wants to say something. Do you want to make? It? Yeah, yeah. I, I guess I guess I was just going to say pretty much the same thing that. Assuming that this uh, probability that the optimal policy visits each of the states and this shows up uh, to the power minus one in the bounds, to me, this feels like a much stronger assumption than assuming uh, lower bounded condition numbers or upper bounded condition mm. numbers rather than. No, I mean, like I said, it's, it's really, yeah, it, it appears very badly in the proof. Yeah, it would be curious to see how this can be adjusted. And yeah, I. Uh, I mean, I have to. I have to apologize. I didn't. I didn't. Um, I've only skimmed. I've only skimmed this paper, and I know you mentioned it to me before. I think I cite it now, but I didn't. I didn't. Uh... Yeah, no worries. No worries. It's okay. Yeah, we, can, we can talk about this later. So maybe maybe let's uh, pass it over to the people who have questions. I think Ayush was. Uh, yeah, I think Ayush is. I think Ayush is next. Yeah, but Garav also has. Yeah, let's get Ayush first. Yeah, yeah. So let's, let's, hello. Yeah, hey. sure. I, I guess like I have two questions and both are kind of related. The first one is, so what you define as implicit bias is you start in the scale constraint and that scale constraint is maintained throughout the iteration. Yeah. And somehow like when you start at W equal to zero, you have this scale constraint. So I'm guessing any point within this ball is also a valid initialization. Uh, so to be, to be clear, if we started in another initialization, it would be fine. We could just make this right hand side a little bit larger. But um, yeah, I mean, you can actually just calculate the log k by just plugging in the zero policy. It'll get you a log k in the KL. I see. I wait, wait does that answer? Your, does that answer your question? Or I mean, your your intuition about yeah. I mean, there's yeah. There isn't. I didn't mention the base case in the proof, but the base case is basically this right hand side was chosen large enough. To ensure that the proof works inductively and also that it's true at pi zero. Like, like I observe this is a common theme in a lot of non-convex proofs, right? You start in a good domain and then you ensure that that property is satisfied throughout the proof. And I'm just wondering if that is what you call implicit advertisation. Okay, so I mean um, so I should just say that uh, so implicit bias is actually my main, it's my core research area. That's that's why I worked on this. So uh, you might be familiar with a lot of papers that show when they use the term implicit bias they actually mean convergence to an exact object yeah but there there are a lot of other papers that and and typically those require very specialized proofs to prove that convergence uh like you know like this log some x technique that's used for for like the max margin stuff mm -hmm. but um here like i mentioned first of all it's false but second of all there's another thing that i've started calling implicit bias or in some of my talks I call it weak implicit bias and that's literally this um this this term so if you write down mirror descent you write down a mirror descent guarantee in the in a general case mm -hmm. the, the guarantee looks like this it mm -hmm. looks like so for any you know for any Bregman divergence you can write um mm -hmm. You know, I'll just I'll just say nuisance because this term is like this sum of the you know squared 
square gradient or you know whatever you want to call it um mm -hmm. so um this term which is typically dropped in classical presentations of mirror descent but it's nice to not drop it this term is sufficient to imply many um many things that people think of as like a stronger implicit bias so this this term is sufficient to um well let me let me say it another way so uh okay yeah so you can reprove many of the standard implicit regularization results just using this term and so this term is actually what i'm calling an implicit bias and you'll also notice that i have the same term in the td proof you know why isn't td blowing up right like uh why isn't you know because th this thing, like the TD iterations can blow up. Like that's why other people use projections. I used this term in the right, in the left-hand side throughout the proof. And so TD also internally uses. So yeah, to, to maybe to fully answer your question, what I'm calling implicit bias is literally this term in mirror descent um, from which you can actually prove many of these kinds of ball things. Does that answer your question? Sort of, yeah. I, I think I'll just follow up with you uh, by email. I, I oh, that's know. depressing. I thought yeah. I answered your question. Uh, <laughs> uh, thanks. Uh, another question I have is, uh, okay, does this analysis become super easy if you look at continuous time, like both loops are continuous time? So you're literally solving some like TD flow, I guess. I... Well, what does stochastic mean now? SDE, super easy SDEs. <laughs> <laughs> Just use Ito's lemma. It's yeah, yeah. Just use like you know seven PhDs worth of knowledge to prove that like you know the thing is continuous. Um, but let me let me let me stop being a jerk and let me let me answer the question for real. So um, I, I guess like I, I, I'm if you had access to okay, this is a stochastic problem. I guess no, no, it's fine. Look, look, I'm being I'm being a jerk, right? I can answer your question. So I can say a few things. So one is that this term okay for us is actually this here so this term this is one of those things that gets zeroed out when you do continuous time uh that term was kind of annoying but not a big deal in the proof so so far this is not really helping from continuous time um now in order to prove if you're really using an sde in order to prove it doesn't blow up you're gonna have to do some sort of like bounded noise thing and um yeah honestly uh uh i'm yeah i'm really okay so just to summarize we can look at continuous time in two places one is in the mirror descent outer loop where we'll just remove this term but this term wasn't a real big deal all of the work in the mirror descent was setting up the kale so that the td worked well that was like the real rub of the proof the mirror descent part of the proof is actually trivial what's Non-trivial is getting the TD not to blow up. Um, and, oh, I, yeah, I should, maybe I should have said this. If you use our paper and you have an exact Q function, an expectation, then you just get, you recover the bound from Garov's paper. It's like a two-liner, right? Mirror descent is line one. Line two is performance difference lemma. Uh, same rate, one over T. Um, no, I, I okay, sorry, I'm, I'm rambling, but... I'm really nervous about the SD approximation of TD, what it means and what its analysis looks like. Yeah, because to prove that TD doesn't blow up sounds crazy for me, but it's a good idea. I mean, I think it's interesting. Right. I mean, are you coming Are you coming to Cole? I may not. Okay, okay. well, I'm, I'm just saying like, one of my friends here at Illinois is this guy, Maxim Reginsky, and he's like SDE master and- um, Right, right, I, I know Maxim. So, so, probably so i'm i'm just nervous about the, the what it means for the td sde to not blow up and that's just not something i can do on the fly that's I, a good question. I, I, think like, I i should just like say the reason i was asking this is okay at least like in deep learning people are have started to look at like continuous time convergence and then like arguing discrete time convergence after showing the continuous time convergence and like either like pathwise coupling or some other methods so I was just wondering like if in RL also there are some similar connections. Well, I can make two comments here. So mm -hmm. the first comment is that typically what that gives you in the deep learning analyses is it removes uh, this squared gradient term. Um, but there are also proofs that handle that term. 
you also are paying a huge price when you do continuous time for deep learning because if you're doing deep learning with if you're doing deep learning with the ReLU, you're not a smooth flow. So then sure. you have to use this Clark differential. Sure, sure, sure. And the Clark differential is a source of terror. Like, uh, like just ask people that know about Clark differential inclusions. It is a source of terror. I right. get emails. I get emails from people before deadlines where they're like, "I'm worried that I've used the Clark flow incorrectly. Can you just check my paper before I submit?" Um, so <laughs> you know, like uh, I, this happens. So like, yeah. Um, my second comment is that people are also using SDEs to analyze, like um, um, GUN Lee and, and Sanjeev Arora at, at, um, at Princeton are doing this. And uh, yeah, that's interesting too. But let, let's just take maybe, since you're going to email me offline because I didn't answer your other question, like uh, it's a mixed bag. Usually for deep learning, you're just swallowing this term. And this term was just not a big issue for us here. It was a good question. Great. Thank you. I think, I think Garo was next, maybe. Uh, yeah. Hey. Uh, yeah. Very cool work. Uh, I actually had a question. I think similar to what I think Chao was saying, like, um, like the dependence on number of states and all those things in the constants. But um, what I'm curious about is like, what, what's the implication if you kind of remove those things? So say you don't have any s dependence or a dependence. You only have dependence on dimension. Um, like what. I'm assuming this is also computationally like similar to this, right? So if you have lower statistical complexity or iteration complexity, then you have also lower like computational complexity. So um, this means that you have like another way of proving a uh, computationally efficient algorithm for linear MDPs. And for, I mean, as much as no, I mean, maybe Chaba knows like maybe there are other ways, but like the only way I know to show computational efficient algorithms for linear MDPs is through this like bonus stuff. Yeah. So this is like, I feel like if you could prove that, that would be like real, like this is like much, much bigger, like in some sense, like to me. Um, like, do you think this is true or this is possible? Or So, I mean, you're, you're, you're being very polite asking this question since like you obviously know 10 times more RL than me. Um, I, I should say that uh, when I started this line of work, that actually was my goal. So partially kind of following what Ayush said, like, I have unlimited faith in the power of gradient descent. Once I realized natural cost gradient mirror descent, I was like, every other algorithm should just pack up its bags because there's no chance. Um, now, that said, um, this analysis, like, I'm very, OK, I would love to prove what you said, Garov, but this analysis is very far from it. Like, if you, I'm going to just say straight, if, if, if you check like where some of these bad dependencies appear, you will just stop being friends with me because there's a <laughs> step in the proof where like some exponential appears and you're just like, oh my God. So, um, okay, so just to summarize, I do have a hope. I think it's, and it's also mathematically interesting to try to determine if this proof scheme can prove what you said, but I would honestly say that based on what I've proved so far, it's completely inconclusive because my dependence on those bad terms is very bad. I will also say that um, for anybody that's curious about this and like curious to do what you just said, or you know maybe you and I could just try to solve it offline, because um, I would like to. I, I actually think there's something fundamentally wrong in how the setup was done in this paper. So I think there's just something about like the TD guarantee, like that squared term. There's something about how it interacts. Like um, I, I mentioned here, you get this TD error term, but but this this is actually not this vis this with the expectation of visitation distribution is not what we got out of TD. So there, there's like a fundamental mismatch in how this paper is set up. And I don't know how to fix it yet. And I think until it's fixed, uh, what you were just saying is not, not possible. Um, I mean, it's also possible that, uh, yeah, so I, I don't, I don't know if, I mean, I would love to be able to do what you said, but from what it's in this paper, it's completely inconclusive. And I think it would be, well, okay, it might be actually trivial to do it. Like you just find a new prox function. Maybe you don't even use like ectropy, you know, use something more clever. Um, but um, yeah, so there was a nice question. I would love to do what you did. It is absolutely unconclusive from what I've done. And I think it's non-trivial based on what I've done. And I think you would have to look very critically at this paper and just say like, that's, that lemma is wrong. Like that should not have been done that way. 
also like do you feel like maybe there's a way to like i mean you could like one way to prove that would be to like kind of improve the analysis but like is there a way you can maybe change the algorithm a little for now you know like add some kind of different terms in there i don't know like what i, mean, I actually don't understand all of this so i'm just guessing here but like you know you add something to the algorithm some kind of expiration term prove things and then kind of show that even if you remove those terms things work out but like maybe change the it setting a little it might actually so yeah it might actually be po that might actually be possible so specifically where uh because you need to explore in like the feature space somehow like yeah. that either comes from like the td thing or um like like how Chala was saying right uh before or i don't know where it will come from um okay sorry i have to tell you so okay there there are two places where bad constants appear in the proof place number one is batting the mixing time that one if you just explicitly project it to some nicer set within the algorithm right. and let's just cheat and let's just say it's an out let's just say you know Paradise up in heaven hands you like the correct constant, right? <laughs> yeah. Like SF hands SF hands you the constant, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah. <laughs> then, uh, <laughs> then. Um, yeah, that's a separate, like, I think, issue that I think comes up because you have like all these like hard instances, right? Like you're in like the setting where you only have one trajectory. But, like um, this other issue is still there, right? This DD error. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. So one, one, one constant. So I, I can, I remember the proof of the mixing times well enough that that part, that part I can ensure. This part, uh, I honestly I can't tell you online what if there's an easy projection that'll just get rid of that will just do this correctly. I see. Um, actually, you know what? Maybe there is. I'll, I'll just say it online. Screw it. I mean, some people. I mean, so I think that if you just did something to condition to add a condition number to the TD, if you just like mm -hmm. do some brutal regularization inside td so that you actually do get an infinity norm bound that uh you could you could do some conditioning that would introduce like the right constants not like one over p min in the rate and then and then if you had the infinity norm then this just goes this doesn't this right. doesn't die anymore so that would be yeah that'd be my candidate that'd be um use some projections to fix the the mixing times and then um do some conditioning to use infinity norm for the td that actually might just solve the linear mdp case yeah maybe that that might that might work okay but i actually don't know what condition number here is like what, what do you mean by condition number here oh like i'm the... sorry yeah so there's um there are many different ways of defining it um but one one way of one way of defining it is that something like this uh something like these are, are strongly convex uh Oh, this is we're, the we're, distribution used by the optimum. Like, where are you getting these axes? I mean, like, yeah, yeah. I mean, this, this, these these axes. Like, um, sorry, I'm using I'm using terminology that's not clear. So, in in the TD update, you you need this to start looking like the gradient of a strongly convex function. I see. <laughs> and I then see. and then um and then you get an infinity norm. If you look in a lot of the TD papers, they assume. They make some eigenvalue assumptions on some matrix defined by these things, right. and I see. And, you know, as an optimization person, I look at it and I just squint, and I'm like, okay, strong convexity. So if you if you do <laughs> if you if you do that, then um, then you can prove that TD gets this sort of infinity norm guarantee. And once you have an infinity norm guarantee, then then yeah. all the disasters in the TD error go away. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, that that is. I don't know if that's a good assumption, but yeah, maybe there is another way to do this. Yeah, I. I mean, off the top of my head, uh, that um, I mean, it, the the condition number. I mean, you'll there'll be this trade-off where you need to condition it so that I mean, the it doesn't blow up, but it's still close enough to the right answer. That'll introduce some term, probably. Um, yeah, it'll be delicate to see if that's good enough to like learn in the correct sense in linear MDP, but. Um, uh, that analysis might actually be, I mean, it should be way easier than the one I did because, you know, all the steps I had to do, like crazy algebra. Yeah. 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 That. Okay. So that was, that was a good comment though. So free out. So maybe we should follow up on about this offline that, um, yeah, yeah the, I'll the, actually email you too. Uh, yeah. I mean, this sounds like, um, that yeah, sounds no, like a inbox. 
<laughs> no, I mean, I'm not like, you know, I don't get that much email. So, so I think, um, I think, um, okay, that's actually not true, uh, but yeah, you guys should email me, but um, uh, yeah, I think it would also be interesting to me mathematically because you could reason that if the, I, I, at least, I don't know if this is the way you're thinking, Gaurav, but instead of just like trying to prove that you can learn linear MDPs, like the crazy, like the unregularized thing, as a first step, try to do with like the SF handed constants. And then if that works, then maybe there's some way to, to yeah. Yeah. I, I like the way you're thinking. Yeah, I agree. It's a good, good reasoning. Okay. Okay. Thank